wisdom have you acquired in the past few months that you want to share with us? Well, I've got one, I think. I, I, I've thought, thought up a bunch of new things, but this one I'm really happy with. Um, I figured out why, you know, I, I, some of you know that there's a mythological trope that I discuss fairly frequently about rescuing your father from the belly of the dragon or the belly of the beast. It's a motif that you see. Well, you see it in The Lion King. Um, you see it when Simba is being initiated by the baboon. Um, I don't remember. Nef Nefiki, I think his name is. Um, after Nella humiliates him because he's still a pathetic adolescent, he follows the baboon. I think it's a mandrel, actually. Um, down underground, essentially, through a long tunnel. There's a lot of kind of scary music in the background, and he ends up contemplating himself in a dark pool, and then his father appears in the sky. And so that's one example of the reconstruction of the mythology of encountering your father in the abyss. You look into the abyss and you see your father. And then in the Pinocchio story, um, Pinocchio, of course, when he's trying to become a genuine human being, instead of a marionette pulled by other people's strings or a neurotic or a, or a liar or a jackass, because those are his alternate destinies, um, he goes down to the darkest place he can find, the bottom of the ocean, and finds the biggest monster he can look at, and inside he finds his father and then rescues him. Um, and the question is, why do you find your father when you look into the abyss? And I really did do think I figured this out, and it's quite exciting to me. Uh, it's such a brilliant image. So we know as clinicians, and, and also I would say as sensible people, but there's good clinical documentation of this, that if you find out, imagine someone's pursuing a goal, and some of the things they have to accomplish or confront on the way to that goal frighten them, and they start to avoid, and then they get more afraid, and of course their ability to pursue their goal or to accomplish their goal deteriorates because they're avoiding. If you're a psychotherapist or even a friend or, or, or a supportive loved one, let's say, you're going to encourage the person to face the challenges that are making them afraid, to face them voluntarily. And what happens as a consequence of that is that the person usually is able to overcome those fears and develop the necessary skills and, and to prevail. And that's partly because, not so much because they get less afraid, but because they get more skilled and more courageous. And so imagine that if you bite off a little more than you can chew, you get stronger as a consequence. And you do that in the gym, for example, when you go lift weights. You lift weights that are a little heavier all the time. And as a consequence, you develop yourself physically and you turn into who you could be. You turn into more than you are. Okay, so if you face fears a little bit at a time, fears and challenges, and you do that voluntarily, then you become more than who you are. Okay, now let's recast that in archetypal language and make it into a kind of ultimate. So, so if you want to become everything that you could be, then you look into the abyss itself, which is the darkest place that you can possibly contemplate. And that would be the terror of mortality and insanity and, and of suffering and, and of malevolence, all of those. It would be like looking into hell, I suppose, to some degree. And then by voluntarily doing that, then you call upon the strongest part of yourself to respond. And the strongest part of yourself is symbolized as the sleeping father nested inside the beast. And so the fundamental truth when you look into an abyss is that you don't see the abyss if you look long enough. It's like the, an answer to Nietzsche's conundrum. If you look long enough into abyss, an abyss, then the abyss looks into you. It's like, well, if you look long enough into an abyss, past when the abyss looks into you, you see who you could become in the form of your of the great ancestral figures nested inside the catastrophe of life. And then you can join them, so to speak. You can incorporate that and become stronger. And you do that partly by taking on the challenge voluntarily. And that informs you because you learn when you take on challenges voluntarily. But you also do that as a consequence of psychophysiological transformation because when you place yourself in challenging situations, let's say the abyss is the archetype of the ultimately challenging situation, then you turn on new genes in your nervous system and in your body that code for new proteins and you build new structures inside of you. And none of that's going to happen without the demand that's placed on you by willing to confront the full terror of life. And so then I would say the full terror of life is something like 
the reality of suffering and death and the ever present and the the ever looming presence of malevolence in your own heart and in the heart of other people so it's evil and suffering and to confront that is really well you risk blindness by confronting that that's also a very old story you risk damaging your vision but if you do it forthrightly then you discover who you could be as a consequence and who you could be is the solution to malevolence and suffering and so that just blew me away when I figured that out it was partly a consequence of um, having lengthy discussions with Sam Harris and thinking this through more and more and being pushed to think it through but I think that's an absolutely staggering um, what would you call it articulating that articulating that image fully for me I don't know if I've articulated it fully but articulating it more fully really had a profound effect on me I think that's it's such a brilliant conceptualization that inside the darkest place is the heroic ancestor that whose identity you could incorporate perfect it's perfect and I really believe it's true and what it does is it says that a human being is actually stronger than the greatest challenge that can be set before him or her and that's really something I also believe it's true it doesn't matter how the other thing that's so interesting about that is that it it transforms pessimism into optimism It's like well the world is a very dark place it's full of suffering and it's full of malevolence and it might even be so full of suffering and malevolence that a reasonable person could question the justification of its being uh, as Ivan Karamazov does in in the brothers Karamazov which I would highly recommend by the way that's an absolutely great book Dostoevsky um, but the the truth of the matter seems to be that if you face the pessimism full frontal so to speak um, then you find something in you that can that's strong enough to take it on and that's really says something about what would you say the relationship between human beings and divinity I would say because it takes something transcendent of transcendent power to be able to rise above the genuine suffering and malevolence of life and I do think that we have that within us if we don't shy away from the challenge so you know there's in in the story of King Arthur and the Holy Grail so the Holy Grail is one of two things it's a cup that either held the wine that Christ drank at the Last Supper or that was used to catch his blood when he was speared on the cross either one but it's the it's the reservoir let's say of the fluid that eternally nourishes it's something like that and when you go to look for the Holy Grail you don't know where to look because you don't know where the Holy Grail is and so King Arthur and his knights who all sit at a round table because they're essentially equals each go off to find the Holy Grail and each of them enters the forest to begin the quest at the place that looks darkest to him and that's another example of the same idea is that what you and another it's another example of a dictum from Carl Jung which he extracted from the alchemical literature which was instur quilinus invenitur which means roughly speaking in filth it will be found or more to the point what you most need will be found where you least want to look but you have to look purposefully if it chases you your prey if you confront it then you're the thing that can transcend it and that's a f unbelievably optimistic message because it suggests that if you're willing to take on the burden of being with its suffering and malevolence that you can awaken that with that which is within you that will allow you to prevail and God only knows how deep an idea that is it, it might be the deepest of ideas because who knows what the, the limit of a human being is so well that's some of the wisdom so to speak that I've acquired in the last few months and there's quite a bit more too and but I'm I'm going to write all this down and hopefully publish a bunch of it in my next book I figured out a bunch about hierarchies too and how they function and a whole I've developed a whole new way of conceptualizing one of the things I was arguing with about Sam arguing with about with Sam Harris was the relationship between facts and values because Sam and he has his reasons would like to propose that we can derive values directly from facts and he wants to do that because he wants to nail the world of values to something solid so it doesn't float in air and and and, and get let's say um, what would you call it hijacked by the fundamentalists or dissolve into nihilism 
and, and both of those are terrible ends for a hierarchy of value. So he wants to nail it to something more objective and, and less relativistic and less, less grounded in revealed truth that removes it from the domain of fundamentalism. And so I can understand his point and why he wants to do that. But the problem is, is that it isn't easy to derive values from facts because there's an infinite number of facts and by necessity, a very finite number of values. In fact, most of the time when you're doing something, you're reducing the whole world to one value. And that value is encapsulated in whatever goal you happen to be pursuing at the moment or whatever you're paying attention to, which is also a form of goal directed pursuit. And so I've also figured out that and I kind of knew this, but I could articulate it better now, that you look at the world of facts through a hierarchy of values, and that hierarchy of values is instantiated in your nervous system and simultaneously a social construct because you pay attention to things of value that you and everyone else have established as valuable through a process of social negotiation. And you need to pay attention to what you think that's valuable that everyone else thinks is valuable because otherwise you wouldn't have any basis for shared attention and you wouldn't have any basis for trade with other people. So that's another thing. So that's really been helpful because so now I've figured out that you reduce the infinite world of facts to the finite world of values by viewing the world of facts through what's essentially a dominance hierarchy of value. And that's and that that exists both out in the social world and neurologically at the same time. And so that's been unbelievably useful to figure out too. And uh, part of a mystery that I've been trying to untangle for about three decades. So that's extremely helpful. And I've also spent some more time thinking about the proper place of the right and the left wing. So the right wing basically stands for the, um, what would you call, the... The right wing serves as an advocate for hierarchy and the left wing serves as a critic of hierarchy and the right says well we need hierarchies they're often hierarchies of competence they're necessary to organize people and society and they're necessary to get things done all of which is true and the left says yes but hierarchies dispossess and you have to pay attention to the wi widows and the orphans which is also true and so then the political discussion is about how to ensure that hierarchies are maintained and are functional but also have sufficient mercy within them to take care of the people who for one reason or another are struggling to find their place even in a hierarchy of competence and then the necessity for free speech emerges out of that because the left and the right have to communicate so that the proper balance between the 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 current structure of the hierarchy and its transformation and mercy can be established on an ongoing basis. So anyways, there are three things that I've really learned over the last few months. And there's a bunch more, but those will do for now. Um.